Hello everyone, my name is Kaze and welcome to another Right Brain tutorial. So I um, thought I'd try something a little bit different for this tutorial and uh, because YouTube ups my maximum amount of time that I can upload my videos uh, so I can make them longer than 10 minutes now, um, I'm going to try to do something that's more spur of the moment, just kind of follow my nose, uh, less planned out, less structured. Uh, that's not to say that my other tutorials or much more structured or planned out, but uh, but you know, basically, I thought, well, you know, let, let me let me see if I improvise and just kind of, you know, talk to you guys as if you were here in the room, and I'm just kind of telling you how I work. So um, what uh, I wanted to talk about in this particular tutorial is how to work with what are known as PBR materials uh, within uh, Redshift and Houdini. Now. Um, of course, I'm using Houdini right here, but uh, everything that I tell you should be applicable to other programs like Cinema 4D or Maya because Redshift is fairly universal in the way it does things, uh, except for a couple little details uh, that we'll get to that are very specific to Houdini. Um, beyond that, uh, the other caveat that I wanted to say is that um, I have, you know, adjusted uh, the way that I do things to my personal workflow. I uh, have my own preferences. I find that there's a lot of uh, subjectivity actually when it comes to how to use some of these textures and what the proper way of doing things. So, uh, you know, this is my way. This is what works for me, but uh, you guys might have uh, a different way of doing it or other tutorials might be telling you, oh, you should be doing it this other way. Uh, don't get mad. I'm just trying to share information as to what works for me. So um, hopefully what works for me can also work for you. But I always encourage you to check out other tutorials and talk to other people and kind of, you know, figure out your own way. So let's get going. Uh, what are PBR materials? PBR stands for physically based rendering. And uh, basically, uh, PBR materials are usually derived from uh, photogrammetry or photographs that people go out and take, and they usually kind of uh, work really well for a very natural type of, um, you know, organic sort of textures. Um, some examples, uh, here's a website uh, called Quixel Megascans, and they have all this uh, really cool materials, um, and um, you can kind of see, like, you know, some of these very you know, like very detailed and very organic looking kind of uh, surfaces. And uh, another place that I really like is uh, this company called Polygon. Um, they have a bunch of like free materials. Actually, like Quixel has a bunch of free materials as well. So uh, I'm going to post links in the comment section. But you can kind of see, um, you know, these materials, they're typically... Um, you know, based on photographs that the that were taken of real things, and then they meticulously tiled them and extracted all these other maps from it. Anyway, there's a lot of uh, wealth of uh, collections of these, and I encourage you to check them all out. So um, let's get started. And what I'm going to actually do is um, I'm um, I'm going to use this uh, free. Um, texture from uh, Quixel Megascans, which is called Soy Clay Surface. And this is kind of like what we're going to try to duplicate in Redshift. And it's a nice, cool little cracked surface. It's got all this kind of displacement thingies going and all these like little shadow areas. Anyway, it's going to be cool. So uh, how do we get there? Um, the first thing that I'm going to do is in uh, Houdini, I'm just going to create, instead of a sphere, I'm going to create a grid. And if you hold down control and click the grid icon on the shelf tool, it will create a grid right smack in the middle of your scene, which is a nice little handy shortcut. And uh, so, OK, we have our basic geometry. This is our ground. So the next thing I want is uh, some sort of light source. So I'm just going to go under Redshift, under Light Dome. I'm going to create a RS Light Dome. And under here, I'm just going to go in the Shader tab and grab an HDRI that I have handy. This is another freebie. This is from uh, uh, 
Polygon, I believe. Yes. Um, this is uh, outdoor field afternoon cloudy texture. Just click open and boom. So we have this like kind of nice little field and um, anyway, that should do the trick for light. So um, next thing that we need is the actual surface material. And I'm going to go into my material context of Houdini. Uh, it used to be that uh, you would do all of your material creation in the shop context, but um, side effect said no more. It's deprecated. Use matte now. So that's what I'm going to use. I don't know why, but hey, that's what they say. So I'm going to hit my tab and bring out all my different nodes here in the material context. And I'm just going to go into Redshift and I'm going to click on this RS Material Builder node. And uh, let's just give it a name. I'm just going to call it Clay. That's simple enough. And then I'm going to double click on it. And here I have my basic uh, Redshift material, but I don't have an actual um, material surface. So uh, I'm just going to I'm right clicking on the mouse. You can also hit like the tab button button and I'm just going to select RS material and connect the out color to the surface. Boom. And now the only other thing that we need to do is we need to go back to my OBJ uh, context, click on my grid object, go under the render tab and tell it what material I want to use. I click this little guy and I just navigate to the my clay material, click accept, and boom, we should be ready to go. Uh, the only thing I'm missing is a camera, but as soon as I hit render view and redshift, it should create one for use uh, for me. So uh, render view, click, does its thing, boom, here we are. And actually, you know what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to select my camera that redshift created, and I'm just going to hit the little lock button. So whatever I do in my uh, render view, the Redshift uh, render view also is matching. So I'm going to go back into my material. And what we want to do is start bringing in the various different textures uh, for this uh, clay material from um, Quick Cell Mega Scans. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, tab or right click and select textures and I want uh, an RS texture. And uh, the first thing I want is some sort of, you know, your basic kind of surface, your basic kind of uh, clay material applied to my grid. So uh, I'm just going to click here and navigate to my soil clay folder. And um, here are all the different textures that come with this particular material. And uh, what um, Quicksell Mega Scans calls like your basic kind of base material, your color is albedo. Um, other collections tend to refer to this as diffuse. Some refer to it as color. Some refer to it as base. But uh, in the case of Quicksell Mega Scans, they call it albedo, or I'll, I think that's how it's pronounced. Anyway, uh, so I'm just going to click OK on this one and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the out color to my material base properties under diffuse color. Boom, like that. Okay, something happened, but not really what I wanted. So we have turned brown, but this is not really what I wanted. And if I hit refresh here, it still looks the same. There's no, there's nothing here. So what's going on? So uh, this is one of those uh, kind of Houdini specific things that uh, you might not have to worry about if you're in Cinema 4D. And uh, I don't know how Maya does it, but uh, in uh, Houdini, basically, um, anytime that you create geometry in Houdini, it doesn't have any UV maps. And uh, that's a bit of a problem. So we need to create some UV maps for this grid. And uh, the way to do it is uh, I double click under my grid object. Here's my grid in Houdini. And basically, I just want to add what's called a UV. I like to use the UV texture node. Uh, some people like to use the UV project. I think they, uh, they can work for different, um, uh, you know, types of geometry. Uh, I find UV texture for something like a grid to be basically um, you know, it does what I need it to do. How's that? 
So uh, that's it. Uh, I still can't see it, and that's because I don't have my little eye, uh, the blue eye enabled here. As soon as I do, boom, this switches. Now it recognizes that I have a UV texture on my grid, and it is displaying properly. So that's kind of cool. Here, let me make this a little bit bigger. All right, so we have we have our basic kind of muddy clay texture on my grid. So that's pretty awesome. What else do we need to do? So next thing that we need to do is uh, if I kind of like, actually, you know what, I'm gonna turn the lights up just a little bit. They're a little dim. Uh, let's try two. Yeah, two does it. So uh, one of the things you can see here is that this surface is really, really shiny. Um, it's a very shiny surface and mud and clay are not this shiny. So I need to do something about that. Let's go back under my material and uh, let's bring in another texture. Uh, Rest texture, boom. And this time what we're gonna bring is this other texture in the collection, it's called roughness. So roughness controls the reflections in the material, you know, what parts are reflective and which parts are rough. So um, let's bring this in. And one of the first things that I want to point out is that this texture is basically a grayscale texture. Okay, this is kind of what it looks like. So um, I'm going to bring it in. And uh, the first thing that I'm going to say is that typically um, grayscale textures, it's a good idea to enable this little doohickey here called gamma override and what it does uh to the best of my understanding is that it kind of normalizes the um the kind of um uh i guess like grayscale um response i guess it linearizes it um and um you know like gamma one my understanding is just like a straight line it doesn't have any curvature um, so, um, it's just kind of like a way of kind of like normalizing textures that you're bringing in, uh, so that Redshift can, um, appropriately use them, uh, in the way that they were meant to be used. I don't know. Does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, anyway, just click the enable gamma override and, uh, and I think you'll be fine. Um, Cool. So where do we want to plug this guy in? So here, let me expand the material and this is going to give me all the different inputs that are available to me. And uh, because this is the roughness material, we're going to plug it, you guessed it, into the reflection roughness input of my uh, Redshift material. So if I do, the moment I do that, you can see that something changed um, here. Actually, let me, uh, uh oh. Don't have enough screen space for all this stuff. Um, here, let me bypass it. Shiny and enable it. Not shiny anymore. So, so this looks immediately a lot more like what we would expect, like a clay, dirt material to look like. Good. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna enable the IPR under sampling a little bit. That's, that way, it's a little more responsive. Okay, great. So that takes care of our reflection. So now what else? Uh, I don't know. Let's keep digging right into like all the different materials that I'm being given by uh, Quixel. So I'm just going to bring another texture, RS texture node. Click on here and let's see. What else? The next thing that I see here is AO, ambient occlusion. Um, ambient occlusion is basically... Um, you know, like the, the, the way the shadows kind of collect in little tight spots, like corners or little nooks and crannies. And um, technically, you wouldn't really normally need ambient occlusion if you're working with actual geometry, because uh, if you have like a, you know, like a physically based render, then the physically based render should be able to calculate the correct ambient occlusion without any texture map to help it out. However, in this particular case, we're not really working with a, uh, you know, with, with the geometry of all this clay. We're actually kind of working with a flat grid that we're kind of faking this, you know, all of this kind of geometry displacement on. 
So in this particular case, I think like the ambient occlusion map is gonna help us. So uh, let's bring that in and I'll show you how to use it and I'll show you what it does. So actually I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more so that you can kind of see some more of the details. Okay, so um, once again, grayscale. So I'm just gonna enable my gamma override for this particular texture. And, uh, and this is where uh, different people have like a different kind of varying opinions as to what to plug ambient occlusion in. So uh, where I like to plug this node in is actually under the overall color here, like in the overall section of my uh, material node. And um, that works for me. And uh, I found it to be the easier kind of place to put it in. So here we go. Overall color, plug it in, and immediately you can see what's going on. Um, we have this darkening of this uh, shadow areas here. I'm going to disable it. Hopefully you can see from home and enable it again. So you can kind of see, like, it's just kind of accentuating all these, like, little cracks right here. So, uh, cool. Uh, if you didn't want to go into the overall color, where else can you go with it? Um, you can go in the diffuse weight, I'm told. Boom. That also gives you a similar result. Um, I think another way that you can use it is uh, you can multiply it with your um, um, albedo base texture, but uh, as I said, I mean, for me, for my workflow, I just plug it right into the overall color. It seems to work fine. So, hey, if it works, why not? Cool. So let's move in right along. Um, let's add another RS texture node. Okay. And what are we going to do next? We're going to dig up the next thing that we want to add. Um, let's add the normal map. Boom. Okay, this is what a normal map looks like. It's very trippy. So I'm going to bring the normal map texture. And uh, here's where things get a little bit confusing in uh, Redshift. So if you click right here and type normal, there's actually like a normal map node. And this is the way it used to be done, except um, now this node has been deprecated. Once again, like uh, the Redshift guys have figured out that they can do it better, you know, with a different node. So do not use the normal map node in Redshift. This is big no-no, hit delete, gone. Instead, what we want to connect my normal map to is a little bit unintuitively the bump map node, RS bump map, okay? And one of the things that we want to do is we want to change this from height field to tangent space normal because we're not dealing with a height field grayscale map, we're dealing with a normal map. So you want to change the setting right here. Um, and the other thing that you want to make sure is make sure that you do not enable the gamma override. Once again, we're not dealing with a grayscale image, so um, normal maps are a little bit different. You do not want to enable the gamma override when you're dealing with normal maps. So where do you plug normal maps? Um, you can, uh, there's like two options that you have. One is under the overall section, you can uh, put it into this bump input uh, and that will work. Or you can go into this um, uh, Redshift material output node, I guess, whatever it's called. And this also has a bump map uh, input. And I typically like to plug it right here. But as I said, both of them uh, should be pretty much identical. So uh, I'm just gonna go straight into this bump map. And when I do so, nothing happens. Why not? Because I need to actually hit refresh for some reason. Redshift doesn't like, um, doesn't automatically update the image uh, when I plug in like a bump map, I need to hit this little refresh button before I see what's going on. And when I click on that, nothing happens. Whoa, why not? What is happening here that I'm not really seeing the illusion of uh, 3D kind of things, even though I have this bump map happening. 
So uh, Redshift, once again, this is a Houdini specific thing. Redshift kind of wants um, some tangent space normals and um, uh, Houdini doesn't apparently automatically give it to uh, Redshift. So what we need to do is we need to click on our grid objects. We need to click in the Redshift parameters here and under my basic settings, there is this little um, checkbox that says compute vertex tangents from object UV map and that's what it needs to display the bump map properly. So if I click on this guy, boom, uh, nothing happens. That's fine because I actually need to hit refresh. So let's hit refresh and all right, now we got something going on. You can kind of see that there's starting to be a little bit of kind of um, um, like kind of three dimensionality added to the surface and uh, we can adjust, we, we, uh, adjust, <laughs> I can't talk. We can adjust how much this effect is uh, present by uh, clicking on the bump map and uh, changing the height scale to higher, like go even crazy to 50, but it's insane. Um, or, you know, just keep it at one if that's what kind of works for you. But as I said, this is where it gets subjective, you know, like, um, some people like a little bit more pronounced normal map and some people like it to be a little more subtle. Um, so I don't know, I'm just going to bump it up to two just to give it an extra little kick there. Cool. So, um, so this is kind of like, uh, you know, what a normal map adds to my texture. Once again, if I disable it, it's just a flatter kind of looking surface. And if I enable it, it gives me a little bit of the illusion that there's like some, you know, some kind of three dimensionality to it. So cool. All right. So what else can I add to, uh, to my material? Uh, let's, let me make some space. Let's enable another texture node, RS texture, and go dig around and see what else came with this Quixel Mega Scans um, little set. So, uh, so the only thing that actually gives me is an actual proper bump map. Okay, um, and this is what it looks like. This is like a grayscale image once again. Uh, let's bring this in, and the question is, what is a the difference between a bump map? And a normal map, you know, if they are both going into a, like a bump map node, what what is going on? What's the difference? So in my experience, a bump map tends to sometimes emphasize a little bit more of like the kind of smaller details, the little kind of grittiness of the sand, or you know, like little kind of surface imperfections. It's a little bit better at that, where the the normal map is a little bit better at kind of simulating like you know more kind of ridges and things where like the geometry is a little bit more um uh pronounced i guess so um i'm gonna show you the difference uh i'm gonna create connect this to once again another bump map node uh oh because it's a grayscale i'm gonna enable the gamma override and under the map, bump map uh i'm not gonna change this to tangent space normal i'm gonna keep it at height field because um, I think that's the way it wants to see it. So uh, let's see here. Let me zoom in just a little bit and uh, see if we can see the difference. Hopefully the YouTube compression will allow for this. So if I uh, unplug this guy and plug my bump map, once again into the bump map inputs, all right, you can see what's going on here. So all of a sudden we have all these little teeny tiny here. Let me make this a little bit larger. All of a sudden you can see, you can see we have all these little teeny tiny little, uh, I don't know, like textures of the dirt, like, you know, these little imperfections on the surface. So, um, bump map is really good about like this kind of smaller little details. And, um, however, if you look at the ridges areas, they kind of look flat. There's not a whole lot going on there. So how do we get both? You know, how can I get like the best of both worlds? I want like some of the cool, like three dimensionality from the normal map, but I also want some of this kind of little fine detail from the bump map. How do I blend the two of them? Well, the cool thing is that um, 
Redshift actually gave us a way to blend the two. And if I just type bump, I got like this RS bump blender node, and I can use this to basically combine multiple uh, bump maps or a normal map and a bump map or several normal maps, however you want to do it, you can actually kind of use this to kind of blend them all together. So I'm just going to disconnect this guy from here for a second, and I'm just going to plug it into layer zero, bump input. So uh, basically my normal map is going to like um, the base input and uh, my bump map is going to layer zero. And if I click and connect the out displacement out to the bump map right here, boom. Now I should get a little bit of both. Um, and one of the things I can do is uh, I can uh, go into the bump blender mode. I oh, know that's a mouthful. And basically kind of change the bump uh, weight because right now it's actually kind of only displaying the normal map. Um, make this a little bit larger. So this is really basically just a normal map. And um, if I, um, as I increase this layer zero is my uh, bump map. And as I increase this, now you'll see some of the details that kind of starts coming in. Uh, let's bring it to 0.5. Okay, so now, you, now we basically have both happening at the same time. And let's do one. So do, when I do one, uh, basically I'm using 100% of the uh, bump map. And if I click on this additive mode, I think it gives me like 100% of both. Um, I typically don't like that. I don't like the additive mode and I prefer to adjust the blend weight of the bump map because I don't really want it to be this aggressive. Um, a lot of times I just need just a little bit, um, just, just enough to kind of give me um, some, you know, some added definition to this texture. And uh, I think that's all like, you know, 0.4 is fine for, um, for these two um you know these two materials to kind of function together um so you can see like without the normal map with and without the bump map and with so it's subtle but it's there cool all right moving right along so what else have we got left for this texture uh let's bring in um another RS texture and let's go dig around the hard drive to see what else is here. So uh, really like the only other thing that's left here is my displacement. There's this uh, cavity um, that they give you on this particular collection. I haven't really seen cavity in other, um, you know, PBR textures, but um, Quicksell Mega Scans gives you the cavity. I think it's basically, it's just basically to me, it looks like just an, uh, I don't know, just kind of over accentuated uh, sort of um, ambient occlusion, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not using it. I haven't really heard people using it. I suppose you could kind of plug it into the, well, let's try it. I'm just going to bring it in and see what happens. Uh, once again, grayscale. So let's enable the gamma override. And where can I put it? Let's, let's try putting it into the diffuse weight um, input and see what happens. Fuse weight. Boom. That's kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's basically kind of like a, just a more accentuated sort of um, ambient occlusion. I mean, I don't know. Like, if you, if you want to use it, um, go for it. I don't think I'm going to, so let me just... I think I like it better the way it is right now. All right, so the last texture that's left, uh, RS texture node, and that would be the displacement map. Uh, this is also known as depth map sometimes. Um, sometimes it's no, known as a height map, but um, basically they all do the same thing. Once again, grayscale, and this is gonna define how our geometry is actually kind of displaced and elevated on our, um, you know, from our basic grid. So let me bring this in and show you what this does, because I think you're going to dig it. So uh, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit um, so we can see a little bit more of my uh, little square terrain. 
So um, in order to use this, as I said, it's a grayscale, uh, so I'm just going to do the gamma override little thing here. And uh, I'm just going to connect it to its to a displacement node, RS displacement. And the displacement node is actually going to be connected into um, my uh, main Redshift material has a displacement input right here. So cool. So I connected... Um, my displacement texture into the displacement nodes in Redshift and connected it to the displacement uh, uh, inputs and nothing happens. Was something supposed to happen here? Because I don't see it. Okay, so for Redshift to be able to do uh, what's called render time displacement, uh, you actually, we, we need to go back to our objects under our Redshift parameters and there's this tab called the tessellation displacement and basically we need to enable displacement otherwise redshift is just going to ignore the displacement map completely and if i enable the displacement you'll see immediately what's going to happen so i'm going to click on this button and boom crazy all of a sudden we have um a lot of movement in this um you know in this grid like it's been kind of deformed now Here's what's happening. The grid itself doesn't really have that much geometry. I mean, if you if you kind of look here in my viewport, you can see that, uh, well, actually, let's find out here. So my grid has exactly 10 rows by 10 rows. So there's not a lot of polygons in my grid to give me a particularly detailed amount of displacement. That's why it kind of looks crappy, honestly. So uh, the way that you can fix this is uh, there's two ways. One, you can kind of add more polygons, more, uh, um, you know, just kind of subdivide your um, basic geometry. Or you can have Redshift do it for you. And the way Redshift does it for you is by clicking this Enable Tessellation button right here. And basically what it does is just kind of subdivides the geometry, except instead of doing it at the geometry level it does it at the render level utilizing the speed of your gpus which is a lot faster so if i click on this keep your eye out on here and you'll see that we'll get a lot more detail boom all right so this looks a little cooler more organic more detailed as to what it should be except it's too much i mean if we uh compare this with uh the let me see here with this example we are you know this is looks like a mountain range and you know this looks like kind of displaced clay so let's fix that um the way we're going to fix it is just simply to tell uh redshift hey don't go so crazy with it so the way we do it uh you can do it in two places um i like to do it under the redshift um tessellation displacement um parameters in the displacement scale but you can also do it in your material. If you click on the displacement node, it also has the displacement scale. Right here, they both do pretty much the same thing, the way I understand it. But as I said, I prefer to do it um, at this level, at the object level, in the object parameters. And uh, I don't know, let's go to 0.5. Um, all right, so this is starting to look a little bit closer to our um, reference. Um, here, let me bring this up a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this still like kind of a little aggressive. Uh, let's try like 0 0.2. Mm, maybe 0.2 is a little mild, depending on your preference. So uh, let's try 0 0.3. Yeah, 0.3 is pretty good. 0 0.4. 0 0.4 works. It's it's a very cracky, very displaced sort of surface, but. Uh, but, you know, this is basically the way it should look. I mean, obviously, we have a different HDRI. We don't have, like, this kind of more flat lighting. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely getting, like... Um, here, let me try a different angle. Um, let me bump up the light to me even more. Yeah. There we go. So, yeah, I mean, this is kind of sort of like this nice, you know, little cracked earth texture. And now what you can do is uh, you can go and fine tune all the other parameters that we talked about. Um, actually, one of the things I'm curious about is uh, 
let's go into that cavity texture and see what happens uh, if I re-enable it. As I said, I'm going to put in the diffuse weight. All right, you know, with the displacement, it actually kind of looks a little cooler. Yeah, it just kind of gives it that, it gives it that extra kick in the shadows. You know, it kind of makes it feel a little bit more, um, I don't know, three-dimensional, I guess. So, um, so cool. So anyway, so this is how you get to work with a PBR type of material in Redshift. As I said, a lot of the things that I talked about should definitely apply to, um, you know, Cinema 4D and Maya and some of these other, um, you know, uh, applications. And hopefully this gives you a good guide as to, you know, how you kind of like sort out some of these materials. One of the things that I didn't talk about is gloss materials and glossiness versus roughness. And um, maybe I can kind of touch on that, like on a different tutorial. Um, for now, actually, I'm just gonna just very, very briefly tell you this, except, um, as I said, I, ideally, I want to talk about it with a little bit more detail in a different tutorial, but um, in some cases, some um, some connections, uh, or I mean, some collections, I'm sorry, I have to think too many things at once. Some collections, instead of having a roughness texture, will actually give you, uh, let me see here, uh, a glossy texture. Gloss. And uh, the way you use gloss is basically the same way that you would use a roughness texture. Uh, the only thing that you need to do is um, when you go into your uh, Redshift material, you have to like uh, click on your um, RS material node here and go all the way to the advanced tab. And basically, under the reflection, you have to click on this button that says convert from glossiness to roughness. And that should uh, basically, um, it, it, it does this automatic conversion to where it will take a glossy map and it will make it work for a, uh, you know, within the reflection roughness. And it should give you like the same result as a roughness map. But uh, as I said, I should probably go into like more details in a future tutorial. Uh, I think I've talked enough. I think this is pretty long as it is. So I'm just going to say thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Please tell your friends. I hope this helped some of you. Um, and, you know, if it didn't, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for taking up your time. All right. Until next time, I'm Kays, and this is Right Brain Tutorials. Thank you for watching.